Okay, so uh, we have already uh, derived a theory for the potential due to a single point charge last time, right? Uh, using this theory we derived for electric field due to a point charge, which is a conclusion from a Coulomb zone. So this is also a conclusion from Coulomb zone. And then I need to emphasize this one more time. There's no absolute value sign here, so you don't make any charge, uh, negative charge positive, and there's no square here, so they are different, okay? And these two equations, they're gonna be given on the test. You don't need to uh, remember that. I'm not gonna ask you to derive this. This, no, I don't want you to derive this or this. We're just gonna go ahead and use them, okay? And then if we generalize it to a uh, group of point charges, right? That's what we did uh, at the end last time. You're just gonna use this theory for every single uh, point charge, and then you're gonna get a, some numbers, a bunch of numbers. You just add them literally because this is a scalar. This guy doesn't have any direction. You don't need to draw any arrows. You don't need to uh, break it into X and Y components, right? And that's why, that's one of the reasons we wanted to study potential and potential energy because they're scalars. It's much, much nicer to work with them than uh, 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 vectors, electric field and electric forward, they're vectors, right? We do have theories for them, but it's, uh, uh, it's nicer to work with this guy, okay? And then, uh, okay, now we're gonna again apply conservation of energy. Once you see that, once I have this theory, okay, then I should be able to calculate the potential, okay, due to uh, any kind of uh, charge distribution, right? And then, even if it's a crazy electric field, I can use this theory to calculate the potential at certain points. And then if some particle, another test charge is moving in this uh, electric field, uh, I can pick an initial final point and then apply conservation energy, which is nicer than working with the force, acceleration, kinematic equations, right? All vectors. These are all scalars, okay? So uh, now we're gonna take a look at an example. So that's uh, still the same PowerPoint six, slide seven. We're gonna, uh, Take a look at this example. We're gonna use this theory to calculate the final initial potential instead of this. Remember, this is only true for uniform electric field. Okay, this is very limited. You can only use that for uniform electric field. Now, uh, let's see. We have three charges here. So, uh, Q1, negative 35 microcoulomb. So this is Q1, right, negative 30, negative 35. Okay, it's at x equals negative 0.25 meters. Okay, so this is like the x-axis. This is a negative 0.5 meters. Uh, another guy, Q2, positive 45 microcoulombs, okay. At positive 0.25 meters, okay. So say this is the origin. Now a proton is released from rest at x equals 0.15 meters, okay. So somewhere here, a proton, proton is positive, right, it's released. We want to find its speed when it reaches the origin, okay? First of all, why is it gonna reach the origin? Well, let's take a look at that. If this uh, proton is here, so the proton definitely feel the force from each charge, right? So what is the force this guy feels due to this Q1 charge? Okay, proton is positive, this charge is negative, right? So uh, the force between them is gonna be, uh, be attractive. Q1 is gonna pull, uh, Keep proton in that direction. So this guy is gonna feel force F1 from uh, Q1. Uh, Q2 is also here, right? So Q2 is also, po it's also positive. So uh, then Q2 and the proton, they should repel each other. 
So Q2 is going to push Q, the proton away from it. So okay, so Q2 also gives it a force to the left. So of course, this uh, proton is going to be moving to the left. It feels two forces to the left. You can literally just add them up as the uh, uh, net force, right? So it's going to be moving uh, toward the uh, origin, okay? So that's why the problem says, okay, let's find the uh, speed of this guy, the proton, when it reaches the proton, okay? Well, okay, so there are two forces on this uh, proton, so electric forces. If these two forces are constant, right, then we can go ahead and use Newton's second law and find the uh, net uh, the acceleration, which is net force divided by mass of this proton, and then go ahead and use uh, kinematic equations, right, if it's a constant acceleration motion. Now let's take a look at it. Uh, are these two forces constant? Okay. Remember, this proton is moving, right? The proton doesn't stay here, right? If it stays here, then these two forces, nothing is going to change. The proton is going to move toward the origin. When it's moving, do these two forces stay constant? No, they don't, right? Because how do you calculate the force? Well, that's going to be Coulomb's law, right? You can just do Ke Q1 Q2 over R squared. Now you're going to pair these two guys up, right, calculate F1, you pair these two guys up, calculate F2. But when the proton is moving toward the origin, the distance change, right? If I, take a, if I look at F1, these two charges don't change, but the distance between them changes, right? So actually F1 in this case is going to increase, right? And F, no, it's going to, yeah, it's going to increase because distance becomes smaller and smaller. F2, because the difference becomes larger and larger, so it's going to decrease. So you don't know, actually, if you add them together, these two effects, they just kind of cancel out exactly. A lot of people do that intuitively. No, you don't. Okay. This guy increases, this guy decreases. When you add them up, is the sum going to stay constant? You are not sure. Right? You don't know. You don't know. Right? This guy can be increasing like, really rapidly. This guy really slowly. Right? So you can't just say, that. oh, I add them together, constant. No, no, okay, you don't do that intuitively in physics. You, you don't assume things, okay, uh, without uh, doing the uh, math, okay? You don't do that. So in general, the net force is changing in this process, right? So you can use uh, acceleration, you can use a, a, a kinematic equations. So you would have to use conservation advantage, right? As we learn in physics one, uh, Conservation of energy is much, much more powerful than uh, Newton's laws and kinematic equations because it doesn't really need constant acceleration motion, right? Even if the process is really crazy, all I need to do is just set up the initial and final, okay? And then use conservation of energy, re rearrange that equation, I can find things I need. So that's what we're going to do, okay? So then I'm going to call this point initial, right? Then it's going to be moving toward the origin at this point, that's a final. So I want to find the final speed, right? So let's set up conservation of energy, okay? So it's still the same law, right? So uh, now data K plus data UE equals external work. The sum of all the external works. Now set up these uh, two terms on the left. Very easy, okay? The same every time, right? That's why I like conservation uh, laws. Okay, only one charge moving, so I only have one term uh, for the proton. Now, uh, this is also for the proton, right? Q, V final, big V final, which is the potential. Big V initial, the potential, right? So these two guys are the potential at the initial point and the final point, the big V, the potential, right? Now equals, okay, these two forces, they are electric forces. Electric forces, you never worry about them on the right-hand side, zero. Electric force, the effect of the electric forces, it's already in these two terms, electropotential energy, okay? All right, now let's see. Uh, okay, now we're gonna uh, find the numbers from the problem, then we can uh, plug them in. Uh, the proton is released from rest, nice, okay? So that means the initial velocity, little vi, zero, good. And then we're going to find this Vf, so we're going to leave it here, but the mass of the proton, that's going to be a constant. 
okay, the charge of proton positive this number, okay, so you're gonna plug in a positive number, right? If it's an electron, you use the same number, but you, you're gonna do, uh, add a negative sign when you plug in the charge, okay? Because the electron carries negative charge. Now, uh, so the, but these two big Vs, you don't have them, right? So that's something you need to find before you can uh, rearrange this equation and then uh, plug numbers in, okay? So how do I find this big VF, big VI, okay? This big VI, it's gonna be the net potential at this point, right? So which is just gonna be the potential due to this Q1 and the potential due to this Q2, right? So it's gonna be V1I plus V2I. So this guy is gonna be V1F plus V2F, right? Okay, so that's how I'm gonna find them. This guy is gonna be V1I plus V2I, okay? And then how do I find these two numbers? Okay, remember they're just numbers, no directions, okay? No arrows, you don't need to draw any arrows. Let's use the theory we learned for point charge. This guy. So Ke Q1 over R1 plus Ke Q2 over R2. Okay. Now, do we have these numbers? Ke constant, right? Q1, Q2 here, right? Okay. Put this, in, put, plug this to them in. Keep the signs. Now R1 and R2. Remember, what is the definition of this R? The definition is from the distance from the source charge to the point you want to calculate the potential, right? So R1, R1i, so let's call it R1i, it's going to be the distance between Q1, the source charge, to this initial point. This is the distance I plug in, right? Uh, R2i is going to be the distance between the source charge Q2 and the initial point. So this is going to be R2i I plug in, right? So you need to find this number and this number based on these three numbers, right? So that's what numbers you can plug in for R1i and R2i, okay? Then you're going to uh, calculate this Vi, okay? Now you do the same thing for the final potential, right, V1F plus V2F is going to be Ke Q1 R1F plus Ke Q2 R2F, all right? So Q1, Q2 is still the same, Ke is the same. Now the only thing that changes is going to be those two distances, right? Now where's the final point? This is the final point. So the R1F is going to be the distance from the source charge Q1 to the final point. So that's the distance you're plugging. Okay, distance is always positive. You don't have a negative distance, okay. Uh, what is R2F? This is the source charge Q2. The difference, the distance between the source charge Q2 to the final point, so which is this distance, okay? So these are the two distances you plug in for R1F and R2F. Now, okay, you have everything here, plug all the numbers in with the signs, you will find this v, a big VF, okay? And then once you have them, now you're ready to plug all the numbers into this conservation of energy, rearrange this equation, to get this little VF, right? Because now we have all the numbers we need, right? The charge is this, initial velocity, zero, mass of proton, okay? So now you can pause the video, do the algebra. This is gonna take you some time, right? We do have a lot of algebra to do, okay? So you shouldn't expect that you can finish that like in two minutes, all right? Okay, so uh, let's see. What are the numbers I got, okay? So the numbers I got, so this guy, first of all, R1i and R2i, right? So you will get, R1i is the distance between these two points, that's, that's 0.4 meters, right? R2i, it's gonna be 0.1 meter. Okay, you plug the main, Q1 is gonna be negative, Q2 is gonna be positive. So the numbers I got is negative 7.875 times 10 to the fifth volts. Plus, so this guy's gonna be negative because Q1 is negative, right? Plus 4.05 times 10 to the 6 volts. 
Okay, so at the end I got a number three point two six times ten to the six volts. So that's the total VI I plug in. Okay, now you do the same thing for uh, VF, right? So VF it's going to be KE Q2 Q1 R 1F plus KE Q2 R2F. What are these two numbers I got? The two numbers I got is negative 1.26 times 10 to the 6 volts. I still get a positive a negative number for this uh, V1F, right? Because Q1 is negative. Plus 3.6 times, no, not 3.6. 1.62 times 10 to the 6 volts. So you have these two numbers together, what do you get? The number I got is 3.6 times 10 to the 5th volts. Okay, so that's the number I got for final. Now you see that, okay, now I'm ready to plug all the numbers in to find the uh, potential, okay? No, to find the velocity, right? So you rearrange this, this is going to be zero, so you have one half m v f squared equals, move these two terms to the right, you get negative q v f plus q v i. Right? So v f is smaller than v i, okay, that makes sense. You will get a positive number on the right, and divided by one half in the square root, right? So we little v f is going to be negative q v f plus q v i. You can factor out this Q, right? Now, square root. Okay, now you're ready to plug all the numbers in. Do the algebra very carefully. The number I got is 2.36 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Okay, it's less than speed of light, so it makes sense. You can't get anything uh, uh, greater than uh, speed of light. All right? So this is this question, okay? So we have finished the, the uh, theory for uh, multiple single, uh, multiple uh, point charges, right? The theory is still this. You start with this point charge, single point charge theory. You apply that for every single source charge. Then you can find the potential, net potential at a single point, at a specific point, okay? And then if something, uh, another test charge is moving this electric field, you can set up, if you uh, set up initial and final points, okay, especially when the electric field is not uniform, right? The electric field, electric force are changing, right? In this case, the force on this guy changes, the electric field in this whole region is definitely not a, a uniform, right? It's actually very hard to find out, right? But we use the potential and potential energy to predict the uh, velocity of this uh, proton, okay, at a specific point. So that's what we did. All right, so that's it. Now we're going to move on to uh, the hard part, okay? Continuous charge distribution. Continuous charge distribution is always uh, harder than uh, uh, a group of multiple charges, okay, because you, you need to use a new theory, a new mathematical tool, calculus. You don't do algebra. It's not that intuitive, right? It's purely math, okay? That's why a lot of people think it's hard, okay? Alg algebra is also math, right? But we're more familiar with that, okay? So now let's see. But we have done that for electric field, okay? So I hope this part is a little bit easier because this is the second time we see that, okay? So I uh, hope it's going to be a little bit easier. Now, uh, what is the theory? The theory is still that, right? So for any single point charge, I would still uh, use the KEQ over R to calculate the potential due to that point charge. But if I have a continuous charge distribution, right, like, like something like this, right, a uniformly charged, a lot of charge on it, I can't even count how many charges on it, right? What do I do? Well, I would still use that theory and pick uh, this guy, right? I'm going to call it DQ, right? potential created by this guy, dV 
at a certain point, right? but no arrows, right? there's no arrow at all, you don't need to draw any arrows, no direction, and then at the end you're going to add all these degrees from every dq together, right? so the summation becomes an integral, okay? so that's the uh, idea, okay? but then of course you need to find expression for this dv, you're going to make sure it's a, a function on one variable and then you integrate that over the same variable then you can uh, look it up in an integral table and find the answer, okay? Now we're going to start with this ring charge, we have seen this guy before, right? So now uh, let's take a look at this uh, guy again, okay? A ring charge, ring of charge, okay? say it's positively charged, okay, uniformly, and then this guy has a, a total charge Q, and also has a radius big R. So I want to find the potential at a point D, at a point P, which has a distance D from the center of this guy. So this is point P, right? So we have done that before, right? We have done, we have found the uh, electric field created by this guy. Okay, remember, that's already there. And how did we find the electric field? We pick, right, remember, we pick this guy and then draw the electric field of this guy at this point. That's what we did, right? And then, okay, if I call this E1, it's gonna be in that direction. I can pick another guy here, which is gonna have an electric field in the opposite direction. Not exact object, okay. And then the y components cancel, x components add. So I know that for every single charge, for example, if I pick this charge, and I can always find this, the other charge on the, this side, it's gonna cancel the perpendicular components, only the x components left. So at the end, I will only have an electric field in this direction, right? So okay, so only I need to, find the uh, x component of the net electric field. Now how do I find the net electric field in x direction? Then you're gonna go ahead, find dx, find expression of dx and integrate that. That's how, what we did with uh, electric field. Now we're doing the same thing, but with potential. I just want to find the potential at this point. So let's redraw it. So the same ring, uh, uniformly charged with a total charge BQ, at the radius big R. I want to find the potential at the same point P, which has a distance D from the center. Now, uh, uh, do I need to pick a charge at the top and then pick a charge at the bottom and see if they cancel components? No, you don't. You don't even need to do this part. Why? Because there's no direction here. There's no arrow here. There's no vector here, right? You go ahead and start with a DQ, okay? I'm just going to call this guy DQ. I don't need to worry about this guy. I don't need to cancel anything. I don't need to use the symmetry to cancel any component because there's no component at all here, right? This DQ creates DV here. I'm just gonna go ahead, integrate this uh, DV. I just need the expression for this DV, then that's it. There's no error here, okay? Now what is this DV, okay? DV Okay, if this is DQ, it's a very, very small element, right? So, uh, infinitely small. You can still model it as a point charge, right? If I model it as a point charge, I should be able to use this theory. Ke, now the charge you call DQ, oh fine, I'm gonna write DQ here, over R, okay? All right, so that's what I'm gonna do. Ke, DQ, over R, okay? So let's see what I'm going to do next. Remember, what we want to do is that I'm just going to make sure whatever inside the single only has one variable. Then that's it, right? How do I make sure it only has one variable? Well, first of thing I can do, I can take this KE out. 
outside the sin cause, I would have dq over r. Now I have dq, I have r. So dq is a variable. What about r in this case? Okay, what is the definition of r? The definition of r is going to be the distance from the point charge to the source point charge to the point. You want to calculate electric potential. Okay, so in this case, this is the r. Okay, uh, how do I find this r? Well, that's easy, right? I have a right triangle here. So the r, uh, and for this dq, okay, it's just going to be square root big R squared plus distance squared, right? Uh, is this r going to be a variable if I pick a different dq? Say I pick a dq here. Because remember, at the end, you're going to integrate dq. So basically, you're going to add all the contributions from every little piece right, on this ring. You add them together. That's why it becomes an integral. If you pick this dq here, what is the r? Big r, distance d. So this is still going to be r squared plus d squared. Oh, the same, right? So every point you pick, you're going to get the same right triangle. Not on this plane, right? You may get a right triangle on this plane in that direction, but you always get the same two sides, big R and D, because there's no charge here, right? There's no charge here. All the charges on the ring, right? So you always get one side of the right triangle, big R, the other side, little d. So the hypotenuse is going to be the distance. Okay, so that is nice. That means I can take out this R, okay? This R is always going to be this. This R is not a variable in this problem, right? KE, R squared, D squared, square root. Now we have seen this before, right? Integral, DQ, no function here. Literally just means you add all these little DQs together. If you add all these little DQs together on the string, what do you get? You just get the total charge, right? Whatever this total charge is. Okay, the problem tells me is a big Q. I'm just going to use a big Q, right? If the problem uses a different symbol, I can use a different symbol. If you, the problem tells me a number, I just plug in the number. But anyway, the final potential is going to be Ke over this. And these are the symbols given the problem, right? K is the constant, big R is the radius of the ring. Little d is the distance from the point to uh, the center of the ring. Of course, you're going to specify the point, right? And big Q is the total charge of this ring. I'm done, right? I'm done, right? So I don't even need to use an integral table because at the end, I, I didn't need to integrate anything, right? I don't have any function here. I don't have any function here. So, so that's the magnitude. What is the direction of this potential? There's no direction, okay? Do I need to say that, oh, the direction is in x direction uh, in this way? No. The potential doesn't have a direction. The potential is a scalar. It only has a value, right? If you give me Q, the total charge, you give me these two distances, I can plug in, I can get a number, like 10 volts. That's it. That's the potential at that point, all right? Okay, we're done with this ring, right? Isn't that nice, right? Okay, you still need to start with this integral, okay? But you don't need to draw any arrows. You don't need to uh, find components, okay? You still need to uh, find a way to integrate this, uh, uh, f uh, carry out this integral. But in this case, we didn't really integrate anything, right? Because we put out everything constant. So that's the conclusion for the ring. And then we can uh, use the uh, very uh, smart way to check if this answer makes sense, right? Imagine you pick a point really, really far away from this ring, right? So that means this little d is going to be like, say, a mile away from it, okay? So in that case, what is going to be this expression? So the expression is going to be this, right? That's what we just found. The net potential at point P is going to be Ke over this times bq. What if the little d is really, really large, so it's much, much greater than the radius, the size of the string, right? So this potential is going to become almost, so if little d is much, much bigger than big r, so you add these two numbers together, you can safely drop 
big R, right? Say this is like one, this is a thousand. So you add them together, it's only gonna make it, this, this one is not gonna make any difference. So this is gonna be almost square root d squared over q. And then square root of d squared, you're gonna get ke q over d. Is this a surprise? No, this is exactly the equation for a point charge. Okay, so that means when you pick a point really, really far away from the ring, the potential at that point, okay, it's going to be the same as if the ring uh, a charge, a point charge BQ at the center. Is that a surprise? No, when you're really, really far away, you look at this ring, it's just a point to you, right? Of course, the effect is going to be equivalent to a point charge BQ at the same, okay? So this answer doesn't make sense, okay? All right, so that's the ring. Now uh, we're gonna move on to the rod, okay? And actually we learned that the rod is uh, uh, more difficult than the ring, even though it looks like simpler, but actually the rod is more difficult than the ring, okay? Because it, it will have variables, okay? But again, let's use the same theory. I'm gonna draw this rod. So say a uh, positive charge. Now I'm still interested in the point P which has a distance D from the center of this rod. So, okay. Again, now we're working with potential. We don't need to pick a charge at the top, draw the electric field, pick a charge at the bottom, very bottom, draw electric field, say the Y components cancel, only X components add. No, you don't, right? You don't need to cancel anything. You don't have any components here. Just pick a DQ and go ahead and find DV and then integrate that, right? Uh, I'm gonna pay a pick a DQ here, okay? Okay, it doesn't, okay. Let's not pick a, a DQ at the top. I can pick any DQ. Uh, pick this guy, okay? I pick this DQ, and then this DQ, it's gonna produce uh, potential at this point. What is that potential? I'm gonna call that DV. How do I draw that potential? Well, you can't draw that, it's a number, right? It doesn't have a direction, you don't draw an arrow, okay? You don't draw an arrow, it, there's no arrow here. DV is a number, a potential, right? Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do Vnet equals integral of dv. What is the pressure of dv? The same, right? I'm gonna still use this theory for point charge, ke. Okay, what is the charge? dq over r. That's it. Okay, let's put it in. Nothing has changed, right? Nothing has changed. Now, uh, take it some constant now, if there's any. ke is a constant. Is this R a constant here? Let's draw it out, right? So this is how I'm gonna draw this out. If this is a DQ I pick. So this R is gonna be this side square plus D square. Of course, this R is not gonna be uh, a constant along this reward, right? Because if I pick this DQ, this is gonna be the R. If I pick this DQ, this is gonna be the R. So R is gonna definitely change, right? So this R is not a count, you can't take it out, so you will need expression for this R. But we have done that uh, with the rod, right, in the electric field part. All I need to do is just say, set up my origin here. I'm gonna call this as my origin. So I need this length. This length is gonna be the Y coordinate of this DQ, right? It's gonna be the Y coordinate of this DQ because the Y coordinate just tells you how far away it is from the origin in the vertical direction. Okay, if this, if I tell you this guy is at y equals five centimeters, oh, you're just telling me it's five centimeters from the uh, origin in vertical direction, which is the distance I need, right? Which is this side of this right triangle, okay? So if this is the side of this right triangle, I would just write this r as square root y squared plus d squared, right? Okay. So that's gonna be how I write this R, okay. But what about this DQ, right? Now I still have this DQ and this 
y here. So d is a constant. This d has nothing to do with this d. Okay. This is a constant, but I have y and dq. Again, I don't want to have two variables. I want to have one. All right. So you have a, I have a function of y. So I should write this guy in terms of y. And again, we have done that, right? I'm going to still imagine this dq has a very, very small length I call dy, right? And then if this guy has a very, very small length, right? 0 0.00001 meter, doesn't matter. I'm just going to call it dy because this symbol d means it's infinitely small, okay? This is a mathematical symbol for that. Now, uh, how do I write this dq in terms of dy? Remember what we did. I'm just going to divide the total charge over the total length and then times the very, very small length of this segment I pick, right? So that's how I'm going to do that, right? These are symbols, but if you think about it, what it means, it is intuitive, right? You divide the total thing, whatever it is, over this total length and then multiply that by the length of the small segment, right? Okay, so this thing we usually call lambda e, right? But again, it's just a symbol for this, right? We, we don't want to write Q over L all the time. We just call it uh, lambda e, charge density, right? Velocity equals distance over time. We can do without this word, velocity, every day. I just say distance over time. But it's useful, so that's why we define something velocity. So I don't need to say distance over time, okay? I just say velocity, everyone knows what I mean. Okay, so that's what I'm, I'm going to do next. So I'm going to rewrite this thing as Ke lambda E dy over y squared plus d squared square root. Okay, I'm ready. Now I'm ready, right? I just need to take out this lambda E and then find this integral in the integral table. But what are the bounds of the y, right? If you call this is your origin, Right, we have done that before. The total length is L, so the minimum value you can get on y axis is going to be negative one half L. The maximum y value you can get on this rod, remember you're going to integrate on this rod. So you're going to find the bounds of this y value on this rod. So that means I would just get the bounds the same y equals negative one half L to y equals positive one half L. Okay, so now if you take out this lambda e, you just get this whole thing. Now you're ready to look it up in the integral table, okay? But this is something you need to know how to uh, derive, okay? You need to know how to use the fundamental theory to find this integral in terms of one variable. Then you go ahead and use the integral table you're given to find this uh, ele uh, electric potential. Okay, now let's see if there's anything on this integral table which has the same form. Okay, so take a look at the integral table posted on Sakai. Uh, I want d something over something squared plus a constant square, square, uh, square root at the bottom. So it should be 32, right? So I'm going to write, write down 32 here. So what I found, x squared plus a squared. Oh. dx. Right? So that's what 32 is. And it's going to be equal to natural log x plus Uh, plus minus, but I don't need the minus sign because I do have a plus here, right? So plus x squared plus a squared. All right, so that's gonna be the integral. Okay, now I'm ready to use this result to plug the lower band, upper band in, right? So now this thing is gonna be equal to ke lambda e. Now the y is gonna be the x, the d is gonna be the a. So I should get natural log y plus y squared plus d squared. Now the bounds are going to be from negative one half L to one half L. 
Okay, now I'm going to plug the bounds in. Okay, so I will get KE. At the end, I will get KE. Now I can write this lambda E as Q over L, right? Plug it back in. Or you, if you want, you, you can just carry Q over L all the way, right? Now plug the upper bound. That's going to be one half L plus, right? If you square this guy, you get four L squared over four plus D squared. So that's the upper bound minus natural log one half L or negative, right? You're going to plug the negative, uh, the lower bound in negative one half L plus square root. Now this y square uh, negative one half L square, you still get square root a uh, square L squared over four plus D squared. So that's pretty much it, right? And that's as simple as you can get. Well, of course, you can combine these, uh, these two uh, natural log. If you still remember that uh, logarithm A minus natural log B equals natural log A over B. You can make it look a little bit nicer, right? But that's pretty much it, okay? I can't simplify uh, this. This is not a square. Okay, so that's going to be the final answer. Okay, again, you don't need to memorize this final answer. There's no point doing that. Okay, now, I'm not going to give you a question. Uh, do you remember this answer? Uh, plug numbers. Yeah, I'm going to give you L and D and Q and L or something like that. You may get a question like that on the homework because I want want you to uh, get used to uh, all these symbols. You know what these symbols mean. Okay, do some algebra. But what we are learning here is how to use the fundamental theory to set up the integral and then reduce it to everything into a function of one variable then I'm going to go ahead and use the integral table to evaluate that and then plug the bounds in to get the final answer okay whatever numbers I get I can plug that in but that's going to be the last step okay but this is what I want to know this is what I want to see on the test all right so again, there's a uh, way to check if this answer makes sense, right? Uh, by making this point P really, 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 really far away from it. If it's really far away from it, so uh, what do you get? So you will get So that means the D is going to be much, much greater than L, right? So you're going to put them together. Well, this time it's not that easy to see. I'm just going to tell you the answer, okay? You're going to use that. You actually, you actually use, you need, you need to use the Fourier uh, series to uh, figure that out. So we're not going to do that here. But at the end, this thing is going to be almost, so K, Q over L. So this guy is going to become almost L over 2D. Again, this is not intuitive at all, right? Compile this. How do you know that when this uh, uh, D is much, much greater than L, this guy is going to become almost that? You're going to use the Fourier uh, series, okay, to expand that, okay? That's why you should always use math, okay? You, should, you shouldn't always trust your intuition because the intuition is really limited, okay? Okay, and this term is going to become almost this, and then you do the algebra, this is going to become K E D Q over D. Again, is this a surprise? Of course it's not, right? Because this is exactly the theory for a point charge. So that means when you pick a point one mile or two miles away from this rod, the potential you calculate at that point is going to be the same as if there's a point charge big Q right at this point. Of course, because if you're really, really far away, you look at this rock, it's just going to be a point to you, right? So the effect is going to be equivalent to a point charge at the same. So this equation, this conclusion doesn't make sense, right? If you take this limit, you get a different answer. Well, then you're going to put a question mark here, right? There must be something wrong, right? Because if I take that limit, the answer should be almost uh, 
a potential due to a point charge in the same. Okay, so see, everything is constant. Everything is constant uh, in physics. All right. Now, uh, okay, so we have completed this. So uh, this is the again. This is something you need to know, right? You, but we're not going to go to two dimensions. But you need to know how to use the fundamental theory to uh, calculate the electric potential due to a one-dimensional uh, continuous distribution of charge. Okay, but there's a connection between the electric field and electric potential, right? So we have seen that electric potential is definitely a lot easier to uh, work with to find out than electric field, right? Potential, uh, yeah, you still need like when this charge distribution is really complicated, the uh, math is still going to be very hard, but it's still going to be a lot easier than electric field because everything is a scalar. Right? I don't need to worry about components. I don't need to break everything into components. And then the nice thing is this. Even if you want to find the electric uh, field, okay, say I still want to find the electric field from this guy, right? you can still find the potential first. And then once you have the potential, you can use the theory. Remember, as I said, there is a theory between uh, fundamental theory in physics that connects the conservative force and the potential, right? For every conservative force, you can always define a conserv uh, uh, potential energy. And then once you define potential energy, you can always define potential this way, right? So this is a connection between the field and the potential, okay? And then if you take the inverse of each side, you actually can find the electric field as a function of this uh, potential. What is the inverse of integral? That's a derivative, right? But if this uh, electric field is in three dimensional, it's three dimensions, you're going to take the derivative in every direction, right? So that becomes a gradient, okay? It's a fancy name for a derivative in uh, all three directions, right? So you can derive that. We're not going to do that here, okay? I'm just going to show, I just want to show you this is a complete theory. The electric field is going to be the symbol for this. It's going to be the uh, inverted right tri uh, triangle. Okay, so if you can find expression for the potential, okay, using the fundamental theory, finding the electric field, you just need to take the derivative. Okay, and this is just going to become you're going to take the partial derivative of the potential in x direction. Okay, and the partial derivative of this being y direction. So this is a theory, fundamental theory in physics. So this just makes the theory of potential and uh, electric field complete, okay? Even if I still want to find the electric field, okay? I can, instead of using superposition principle, I can still calculate the potential first. Okay, this makes my life easier. And then I use this connection between them, just take derivative. So mathematically, this is always uh, uh, doable. Okay, so uh, we can check, okay, a few uh, examples to see uh, how this makes the theory complete. Okay, so for example, we uh, remember we derived the potential for a point charge is Ke Q over R. Right. Well, we derived it using this equation, okay? But if you go back, you can actually find the potential, okay? In this case, you only take the derivative in the radial direction, d over dr, okay? Ke, q over r. You take that derivative, you, ke and q, they're constant, right? So you only take the derivative of this r in this radial direction, so that's why you're going to get a, a unit vector in that direction. You do this algebra, you take the derivative, d over dr, so you can take the derivative of 1 over r, you actually get negative, if you still remember this, that's actually going to give you 1 over x squared, negative. Okay? So this is going to give you a, a, a actually ke, because one negative sign and this negative sign they can cancel, right? And this is going to give you the uh, theory for the electric field, okay? And of course, because we derive this using, uh, derive this to derive the potential using this theory. Of course, when you 
do the inverse, you will get that. Okay, so that's a check. And then you use the uh, potential we derived for the ring, okay, which is this for the ring. Uh, we derived it as KE. So all these conclusions, you don't need to remember them, okay? D squared. Okay, now if we make this D as a variable, right? Because I want to make this uh, equation a general conclusion for any point, any point on this axis, right? So I'm not going to call this variable X. Because this x can be any number on this axis. And then I'm going to replace this with x. So that means the electric field is going to be d over dx. So now you only have x component. You can just take a derivative in x direction, and it's only going to give you x component, right? Again, if you take this derivative okay it's going to be a little hard but now uh, we're not going to do that in this class i just want to show you this is going to be a complete consistent theory you will get ke q x over x uh, r squared plus x squared to the power three halves and then x direction, right? So it gives you the direction in x direction and the magnitude, which agrees with what we did. Remember, when we calculate the electric field uh, created by the string, the electric field is in x direction here. The magnitude, if you compare this with the with power point three, right? We derive it in power point three, and then the uh, slide eight is the exactly the same uh, expression, right? Now we just call this x, but in that uh, slide we call it d, okay? And then you can do the same thing with the rod, okay? So you use this expression, now you're gonna replace this d with x, so make it a variable. Okay, a variable doesn't have to be x, right? Because the people, oh, you usually use x. You don't need to really replace d with x, okay? And then you're going to take the derivative of this whole thing with respect to x, because this function only has x. So you don't need to take derivative with uh, y or z, because you're just going to get zero in these directions. I'm not going to do that. So at the end, you will get this expression, and then you compare this expression with the conclusion we derived in power point 3. Again, uh, slide 5, it's going to be the same. Okay? So everything's consistent. Everything's consistent. All right? All right, so that's the potential in electric field. So we, we have made a complete and consistent theory, right, with electric field and potential. So even if I want to find electric field, I can go ahead, find the potential first, because it's a scalar. And then I'm going to take the derivative of this potential to give you the electric field, if you still want the electric field, right? Now let's summarize these two different theories we learned in electric potential, okay? First theory we learned is the uniform, okay, I erase that. But it's a uniform, okay? Electric field. For uniform electric field, the potential difference between any two points is always gonna be E times the distance in the direction of the electric field. Right. You only get the value if you do E times D. You don't know which one is higher, which one is lower, but you take a look at the direction of the electric field lines. You know which one is higher, which one is lower. Because right? the direction of the electric field is always in the direction of decreasing potential. Okay? That's what you use if you want to calculate the potential difference, or even if you want to calculate the potential at a specific point, you just need the problem to give you a uh, reference point. Right? That's the theory you use, okay? This is only true for uniform uh, electric field parallel plates. If you have point charges or continuous charge distribution, okay, you use this theory we learn, The theory for point charge, okay, the potential is going to be this. And this guy is going to already give you the potential actual value at any point because when we use this theory, we have agreed 
we're just going to take the infinity as zero reference, right? So you don't need the problem to tell you uh, where is the zero. Everyone agreed on that, okay? So this is just going to give you the actual value of the potential. Of course, if you have a group of point charges, you do this for every single point charge, and add these numbers together, literally, right? There's no arrows, no vector. Of course, if you have a, a, a continuous charge distribution, you're going to start with this theory to, uh, and then uh, evaluate the integral, okay? So don't confuse these two theories with each other. That's a common mistake I realized that some people they will make. They, they either use this equation for point charges or use this equation for parallel plates, okay? Don't use the wrong theory, okay? You can compare these two theories with electric field. We also learned two different theories for electric field, right? The uniform electric field between two parallel plates, we have a very nice equation for that. So you only use this equation for parallel plates, right? We also have a uh, e theory for point charges, which is this. When you see point charges, you want to calculate electric field, you're going to use this to find the magnitude and direction. You're going to take a look at the sign of the source charges, right? This equation is only for uniform electric field between parallel plates, okay? So you never use this for point charges. You never use this for parallel plates, right? So that's the same deal here. Don't use the wrong uh, theory, okay, when you uh, solve a problem, okay? And you are gonna see some uh, problems on the homework. So you can practice, then you can uh, understand the difference, okay? So I'm gonna stop here uh, for this video.